All right, appreciate everyone joining us for Coach Franklin's weekly press conference. We'll start with an opening statement from Coach, and then we'll open up to questions. Yeah, so uh, like always, appreciate you guys coming out and covering Penn State football. Um, you know, going back and, and watching the film from this past game was kind of about what we thought uh, and what we discussed afterwards. Uh, I think you guys have already seen players of the game and, and all those types of things. So um, I'm going to move on uh, to our next opponent, uh, which is obviously Illinois. And um, Brett Bielema, who I know very well, was on the Nike trip with him for a long time. Um, he's done a really nice job. Obviously, he's got a ton of history uh, as a head coach. He's been around some really good coaches and some really good programs. Did a great job when he was at Wisconsin. Is doing a great job now at Illinois. Uh, had some time in the NFL as well. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's going to be a heck of a game. Obviously, their road win. Uh, on the road uh, at Nebraska, which was a was a really big win for them. Uh, so they're coming in here confident, but they're also coming in here uh, already going on the road and and um, finding success in a, in a tough environment. Nebraska is a storied program. They take a lot of pride in their stadium and their game day environment as well. Um, so. So I think that'll give Illinois a ton of confidence coming, coming into our place. Uh, you know, when you talk about their offensive coordinator, uh, Barry Looney, who I think is doing a really nice job for them, kind of a combination of his background uh, and Brent's background in terms of what you know, they want to do and what he wants to do. It's a really nice mix kind of of the two systems. Um, and they're putting up some really good numbers. I think the biggest difference, right, is the quarterback. Uh, I think he's got 10 touchdown passes and zero interceptions. I think he's one of the more improved players right now in college football. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the big story. Uh, young man that transferred, I think, from Mississippi State, if I remember correctly. Uh, the running back, uh, number three, Fegan, um, he is a thumper. He's 250 pounds. Uh, and then they've had really good production out of wide receiver number 13, Bryant, and wide receiver uh, number four, uh, Franklin. Guys have been very, very productive for them. So doing a nice job. Um, they do a really good job, again, mixing up personnels, mixing up scheme, mixing up tempo. Um, I think the offensive coordinator's background is tempo. I think, I think if you look at Brett's background, it's, it's – uh, more about uh, runs plus completions and uh, being able to run the ball and, and being physical. So they've blended the two, uh, I think, very nicely. Uh, and then defensively, I think Aaron Henry's done a really nice job as a guy that, that we they promoted uh, when obviously their defense coordinator left to go be the head coach of Purdue. Uh, and Aaron's done a nice job. Obviously, Brett's got a defensive background as well. Um, but they're, they're really playing well and uh, has done a nice job. He's a defensive back coach by trade, um, but is doing some really nice things. Uh, their defensive end, number 17, um, uh, Gabe uh, Akis, is doing a really nice job. His young man has been playing for him, I think, it's a true fr since a true, his true freshman year. Kid out of Florida. Um, their linebacker, number 28, uh, Rosique, um, is a captain for him. Uh, again, another Florida guy who's playing well. Uh, and their cornerback in nickel, number 14, Xavier Scott, another Florida guy. And then their safety, number 10, Miles Scott. Um, I think their secondary is, is really going to be a challenge for us. Um, I think our wide receivers have taken a really nice step and made some really good strides since last season. Um, but we will be challenged. We will be challenged in the, in the secondary this week. Um, these guys do a really good job. They play a decent amount of man coverage, and they're extremely competitive. And then from a special teams perspective, um, you know, uh, Robbie Dishler is their special teams coordinator uh, and has done a good job. We've been impressed with punt returner number 80, uh, Hank Beatty, and then their kick returner number seven, um, number seven, uh, Canari. So should be a good challenge. Don't really have any changes for you guys in terms of the red, yellow, green list. Um, 
obviously don't have any significant changes on the depth chart, um, and I open up to questions. We'll start with Rich Garcella. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good, Rich. How are you? I'm good, thanks. James, we saw Cam Wallace and Dom DeLuca leave the game with apparent with with injuries. Um, can you give us an update on them? Are is either one of them long term? Yeah, again, you know, I, I understand you guys are going to ask these questions. I typically don't have these answers for you. Um, I hate to see you waste a question, but I typically don't have these answers for you guys um, in this press conference because once again, we need time to evaluate the, the injuries um, uh, and we need time to have conversations with these kids and their families um, before I'm going to say something to you guys about it. So. Um, I would recommend for you guys to probably save these type of questions till Tuesday, but it, but if you guys want to ask, uh, feel free to ask. But I, 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 won't, I typically won't have this information for you guys on a Monday again, because we need to totally evaluate the um, the injuries, and sometimes you're talking about MRIs and uh, X-rays and a ton of things that go into that, and then also. Uh, me to be able to have the time to have conversations with them and possibly their families. Let's go to Mike Gross and then Frank Bodani. You're on deck. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good, Mike. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, next year, as I understand it, uh, there's been a rules change where you're going to go to uh, 105 roster limit and all of those guys can be on scholarship which logically, and I think a lot of people have said, will, will, could mean the end or the diminishing of walk-ons. Uh, so have you, I guess, what's your opinion of that rule? What have you done to manage that in terms of talking to the kids in your program who are, you know, preferred walk-ons? Uh, what's your sort of take on that situation? Well, a, a couple things. Um probably not going to get into detail with, with strategy on that. Um, in terms of conversations, um, those conversations we'll, we'll have after the season. I don't think that's a conversation for right now. Um, the other thing that I, I would say to you is the, the rule, the way I understand it, is for the season. So um, that doesn't mean in training camp and in spring ball, uh, your numbers have to be at 105. So uh, in some ways, you're going to create a system where you're going to have almost like tryouts and cuts, like, like you've had you know, in high school and like you've had a little bit maybe in some colleges. Um, guys fighting to get on to the, the active roster, the 105. Um, but it, it will limit some opportunities. There's no doubt about it. And we've had some great stories over my time here at Penn State and really over Penn State's history. There's been some tremendous stories. Um, I don't, I don't think, uh, there's too many coaches that, that love it. Um, you know, it, it, you look at some of these programs, I don't mean to talk about other schools, but like you, you look at programs like Nebraska and others that have, a, a really robust um, history with walk-ons. Um, this creates challenges, so it, it creates a lot of challenges for all of us, and some of the some programs more than others. Um, and it and it reduces opportunities, which which you hate to see. I think it's going to help um, FCS programs. I think it's going to help Division Two football. Um, but it's, it's going to hurt uh, opportunities for the kid that wanted to come to Penn State and chase his, his dream and, and see if he could possibly, you know, earn a role or even possibly earn a scholarship. So um, I don't love it, but like most things, this, this all deals with finances and, and budgets. Let's go to Frank Bodani and then Mark Wilgenrich. You're on deck. Hi, James. Good afternoon to you. You as well, Frank. <clears throat> Thank you. So three games in, what is there a point or two about your defense you still really most want to learn about? Is there one or two areas that, to you, still has some proving to go here going into this game? 
Well, um, before I get into specifically answering your question, I think I think the Bowling Green game had some people concerned, right? And then Bowling Green goes to Texas A&M and, and has a similar type game uh, at Texas A&M. So I think, I think Bowling Green's a, a really good MAC team. Um, so, so I, I think that was helpful for me as as well as probably others. Um, but defensively, I thought last week again when when you hold uh, any Division One football team to 67 yards and you say it's the eighth lowest in Penn State history. Um, I think the previous one may have been, or maybe that was the yards differential was like against Susquehanna, mm -hmm. which I, I don't, you know, if I scheduled Susquehanna, I could imagine the, schedule, the, the comments I would get from you guys and the questions I would get in the press conference, uh, especially from Mike. Um, so, um, but I think whenever you hold anybody to, to 67 yards, that's, that's hard to do. It, it really is. Um, so I thought we took some significant strides last week. Um, it's something for us to build on. But obviously, as we all know, when you get into Big Ten play, it's different. And Illinois has done a really good job. They're a physical bunch. The quarterback's playing at a high level. Um, and as you guys know, we've lost some, some significant players um, and has tested our depth. So we're going to have to continue to develop depth. Um, I'm thankful for the 730 game. I know that sounds silly, but with some of the young guys that we're playing, we need every, we need every minute we can in preparation. Uh, and we're going to take advantage of every minute in terms of walkthroughs and, and, and meetings. So um, last week was a nice step. I, again, I thought we played really good in week one. Um, I thought as a team we didn't play as well in week two. Um, but I have probably better perspective on that now than I did after the game. Uh, and then, um, you know, last week I thought we played well. So we're taking a step in the right direction, but we got to get better this week um, as a defense, as an offense, as a team, uh, on special teams, all of it. Um, and I think our guys looking at Sunday's practice, I think our guys are approaching it the right way. Let's go to Mark Wogenrich and then Johnny McGonigal. You're on deck. Hey, James, how are you? Good, Mark. How are you? Good, thanks. Through three games, how would you assess the offensive line, particularly maybe some of the things that Andy Kogelnicki seems to be asking some of the guys to do with, like, the motions and stuff like that? Yeah. Or the, those guys moving, the offensive linemen, you know, moving around. And Yeah, I think, I think we've been pleased with how the O-line is playing. I think they're playing physical. Again, when you're able to, you know, rush the ball for 300 yards and you're able to protect the quarterback – uh, Drew's done a couple nice things in terms of extending plays and his mobility I think has been really big for us. I think last year he probably ran better than people thought um, he would and I think he's taken it to another level this year. Not necessarily just purely running but <clears throat> getting a couple first downs a game with his feet or just keeping plays alive like <clears throat> excuse me, the long play down the sideline that he threw to um, Omari that he extended the play. Um, so I've been pleased with the O-line, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of like the one motion we ran with Venga, I don't know if that's going to skew grades or, or perception, um, you know, or them shifting pre-snap, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't really think that is going to have an overall impact on how the O-line plays and, um, their grades, um, but it, but it's fun. It's, it's cool to see and it's cool to look at, but um, where I think it helps you is it just, again, like we've talked about before, it creates time that the defense has to spend uh, working on it. Obviously, they've been looking at Kansas film. They've been looking at Penn State film from last year. They're looking at Penn State film now from this year. Um, and whenever you're able to put some different things on tape that they have to deal with, whether it's motions or shifts or some of the things you brought up, um, it does two things. It, it, it forces them to spend time on it, and then obviously for us it also creates some opportunities to 
um, take advantage of leverage and angles and grass. Let's go to Johnny McGonigal. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good, Johnny. How are you? Good, good. You mentioned uh, with Illinois secondary uh, could be a challenge uh, with you guys. Um, ahead of that challenge, the wide receiver room, how would you assess how those guys have fared you know, through three games and how prepared do you believe they are not only ahead of Illinois, but Big Ten play in general? Yeah, I've been pleased with the step that we've taken. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that um, Chris and Greg haven't kind of come to me and, 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 and showed me a ton of articles about our wide receivers and, and the steps that they have taken and, and what Marcus and those guys have done. Because um, there sure was a bunch of articles when they didn't play uh, up to, to people's thoughts and, and standards. But, but overall, I, I've been pleased with what they've been able to do. We've got to continue to build it, um, build you know, build their confidence and build their production. But, you know, I, I think it's hard to argue that, you know, they may be the most improved position on the team right now. And, and, and you know, let's be honest, we, we, we needed that to happen. So I think that's, that was fair. I'm, I'm not saying that some of the things that were written and said in the past weren't fair. Um, but again, um, if just like as coaches, if we're going to be critical, then they should be praised when they're doing some really good things, which I think they are. Um, again, to your question, I think this week we'll, we'll be challenged. And, um, you know, we, we got to put them in the best position we possibly can to be successful. And they got to continue to get better uh, and compete and be aggressive. I think we're at our best at that wide receiver position when those guys are being aggressive. And I've seen it more consistently in practice. And I'm seeing it more consistently in games. And I think you guys are as well. Last question on Zoom, Neil Riddell. Hey, James, I was wondering. Uh, hi, Neil. Hi, James. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Tom Allen, is that going to be a permanent thing? How do you feel that uh, that transition went? Yeah, um, don't like to say permanent, don't like to say forever, don't like to say always, um, but thought it went well. Um, you know, again, he hadn't been up there for 15 years, so, um, you know, we talked about doing it the week before, ended up doing it last week, uh, thought there was some real advantages, um, you know, to going up there, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how this week goes, and I could see this being a, a week-to-week -week deal where, um, we do what is necessary, um, you know, with the leadership that we got on the sideline with the staff and the leadership that we have on the sideline with the players. Um, you know, we feel good about that aspect, um, but we've also lost some guys. So, you know, that, that impacts it as well. And as we get younger and, and start to play some less experienced guys, you know, that, that could factor into it. So we'll, we'll see how this thing goes this week, but, uh, last week, you know, I, I do think it was a positive, and I think Tom did as well. We'll go to questions in the room. We'll start with Mark. Hey, James, I see Greg didn't get the whiteout energy uh, notification that everybody else seems to have. Yeah, that's fair. Hey, appreciate your time today as always. Notch. Notch got that's it. That's what I'm saying, Greg Paul. Did not. Paul got it. Chris got it. Hey, Greg. Greg. Paul, come on up here. Switch. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. I'm, I'm serious, Paul. Come on. Switch. Greg. Sorry, Greg. Hey, Greg. Paul, come on. <laughs> come on. You and your alma mater, come on up here. <laughs> come on, Paul. I'm sorry to you too, Paul. There we go. Hey, James, you had an opportunity to see a lot of your young linebackers on Saturday. Do you think any of those guys have separated themselves to the point where you'd be comfortable playing them in a more competitive game? Um, you know, take... Tamir is a guy that we've been excited about really since we recruited him. Um, you know, he had some bumps and bruises where he lost some time, which which would have been really valuable for him and for us. Um, I think that's that's going to be really important for us. Continue to move forward is his durability uh, and his ability to get in the game and play and play well. Uh, and the same thing for practice. He just needs the reps. He's super talented, uh, but he just needs the reps and the time, you know, from a development standpoint. 
Dakari Nelson was a move we weren't necessarily sure how that was going to go. Uh, There's a big difference between playing defensive back and playing linebacker. And obviously people do some things to kind of get you into the box, uh, whether that is you know the position we're trying to play at or not. And Dakari has been a really pleasant surprise. Is playing really well on special teams right now. I think you guys saw he was a special teams player of the week. Uh, and is really growing into the linebacker position. So that's been a real positive for us. Um, obviously, uh, we're going to have to continue to develop depth there. Uh, I thought Specka came in and did some nice things uh, for us this week in terms of running the defense and playing with confidence, and we're going to have to build on that. Uh, Tyler Elsden continues to be a guy that um, has played a ton of football around here, and, and we have a lot of confidence in. Rojas continues to develop uh, into a special player. Uh, and then, obviously, we have some flexibility with Abdul as well. So uh, there are some answers there, but we, we need to continue to, to develop guys and, um, and continue to develop depth. James, you talked a lot about Luke Altmaier and how he's grown. What specifically have you seen him do to take a step forward, and what kind of challenges does that present for you guys? Yeah, I think it's it's the same thing with our guys. I think a lot of times we want to point to a specific reason on why a guy is playing better or a, sp a certain area a guy is playing better. And, and sometimes it's, it's just they're a year older, right? They're a year older, more experienced, more comfortable, more confident, more confident in the system, more confident in their own skin. Um, and he's just doing a really good job of managing the game. He's throwing completions for a high percentage. Um, he's protecting the football. Uh, he's getting the ball into the end zone. Um, you know, he's really doing a nice job, and, and they're doing a great job of mixing the run and the pass so he doesn't feel like he's got to carry the burden himself. Um, but I just see him, you know, he's, he's really slightly improved uh, kind of across the board. Um, Part of that is his maturation and development. Part of that is the offense coordinator doing a good job. And part of that's maybe the offense coordinator knowing his quarterback better. Um, you know, so it's it's all of those things. So I've been I've been impressed I've been impressed with him. Uh, you know, he was a fairly highly recruited guy out of high school and again everybody's path and journey is different and from a maturation, you know, process standpoint he's he's really taken some nice steps. Hey, James. How you doing? Good. I'm doing well. Hope you're doing well. You too. Um, when it comes to that receiver room, Liam Clifford and Julian Fleming are two guys that I think we've really since uh, Julian got here and throughout the year we've been told don't focus specifically on the stat sheet with those, with those guys. Look what they do away from the ball. Look what they do day to day. But to get them both rolling, momentum, production on Saturday before Big Ten action, how, I guess, motive, how encouraged are you by that and what do you think it does for both of them? Yeah, I, I think it's helpful. As you guys know, we want to get a ton of guys involved. And it wasn't, it wasn't really specifically those two guys that don't just focus on just the statistics because it's going to be something, somebody different each week that steps up. And there's going to be somebody that one week has a big game and then the next game only gets a few opportunities. Again, we're going to call the plays and, and run the system. And a lot of times, based on what the defense does, you know, we, we personnel and formation to try to put guys in position to make plays. But again, the defense will ultimately dictate where the ball goes. Um, but back to, I think, my comments after the game. I don't know if I've ever seen a statistic where you have eight different players score a touchdown. I don't know if I've ever seen that before. Um, Whenever you're able to get so many different guys involved and Illinois is not sitting over there saying if we stop this guy, they're going to have a hard time moving the ball. Um, you know, Maybe that was the case after week one, um, but after week two and then after week three, uh, you got running backs touching the ball in a ton of different ways. You got tight ends touching the ball in a ton of different ways and impacting the game. I mean, you know, Tyler's done it as a receiver, as a runner, and as a passer. Um, you got multiple quarterbacks on the field. That that makes it more difficult as a defensive coordinator, as a head coach, to tell your team, "Look, we got to stop these things." Same thing. You know, being balanced in terms of being able to run to win games and throw to win games. 
I think is is really important. So um, having some more guys, to your point, that Illinois is looking at and saying, hey, this Liam Clifford guy can hurt us if we're not aware of him, and this Julian Fleming guy can hurt us if we're not aware of him, and uh, Khalil Dinkins can hurt us if we're not a, a aware of him, and, and Luke Reynolds can hurt you if we're not aware of him, and, and on and on and on, um, you know, with with the wide receivers, tight ends, and and running backs, um, there's there's a there's a lot of value in that for them and for us. Coach, uh, I wanted to circle back to the Tom Allen in the box thing. What specific feedback did he give you regarding that experience on Saturday? Uh, the hot dogs and the food and the temperature. He wasn't going up until the weather came out. There was supposed to be rain and thunder and lightning, so he said, I'm going up into the booth, put Dex on the sideline, let him deal with the rain. Um, you didn't, that's not what you wanted. Didn't get a smile or a laugh or nothing out of you. Um, yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is really the things that we talked about before. Again, um, there's a lot of ways to be right, right? There's a lot of ways to do things that work. Um, you know, there's a lot of different offenses to run, defenses to run, special teams to run. There's guys that call it from the sidelines and are successful. There's guys that call it from the booth and, and are successful. Um, you know, I, I think for me, I'm a big believer that if, if all things are even, the best place to call the game, just strictly call the game in terms of calling the plays, calling the defenses, I think the best place to call it, best best place to call it from is um, the booth. Uh, you can lay out all your call sheets. Uh, makes it easy to kind of write down and take notes. Makes it easy to be focused on the game and not dealing with the fans and not dealing with the emotions of the players on the sideline and not dealing with weather. And it's it's literally calling the game. Um, and I think, you know, he, he wasn't sure after not being up there for so long and, and obviously being a head coach uh, and being on the sideline and all the things that, that come with that. Um, I, I'm not sure if he you know, was sure how he was going to feel being up there. And then I think after going up and doing it, um, I think it, it, it became a viable option for him and for us. And like I said, for a ton of different reasons, you know, we'll take it on a week-to-week -week basis and, and see what's best ultimately for our team and ultimately for our defense. But um, I, think, I think he liked it. I, th I, th I think the other thing we did a good job of is Jevin did a really good job as well as, you know, Rob Smith and, and Thomas Allen who were with him in the booth. We went up there in fr on Friday and did a full dress rehearsal. You know, had Dan Connor on the sideline. We're kind of going through drives and calls and doing the communication. And and Dan was able to communicate with the linebacker. Um, you know, so I think that was helpful as well. Um, so, um, you know, the feedback feedback was good. And again, obviously, when you play when you play well, um, you know that that has an impact too, right? Guess it's my turn. Uh, James, yeah. good afternoon. Um, what went into, good afternoon. Thank you. What went into the decision to kind of start Elliott Washington against Kent State, and what have you maybe learned between A.J. Harris, Jalen Kimber, and Elliott through that non-conference portion? Yeah, Elliott uh, has just been playing really well and, and practicing really well and, and earned um, the opportunity to, to get more playing time. Um, that's that's one thing, and and I don't want this to to come off the the wrong way in terms of Elliot Elliot earn that opportunity, um, but also um, AJ had a little bit of a, a stomach virus on on I think Thursday and Friday, but may have been Friday, um, which was also affecting him, and and we were concerned about that. He missed a little bit of practice time. Uh, wasn't able to to um, you know eat really uh, the day before and and even the morning of, um, but then he ended up you know 
you know, bouncing back and, and playing well. Um, typically, you know, with those type of flus, one, you know, once you're able to get some medicine in them within 24 hours, they usually are feeling better. Um, but again, I don't want that to come off the wrong way because Elliot earned the opportunity by the way he's been playing. Um, but, but, but that also was a factor with, with AJ. Time for two more. And, and the, Kimber, I, I think, you know, we, we feel that not only those three guys, you know, Zion's playing really well right now. Cam Miller's playing really well. I, I think you guys know we feel like we got a lot of depth um, at that corner position, which is also part of the way of how we're solving some of our depth p issues at other positions um, is, is some of those corners being able to play the nickel position, play some of the safety positions, doing some of those things. Uh, is also helped because because we do feel like we got so much depth and talent at that position right now. Two more, T. Frank. Hey, James, all the way back here. Paul, you're doing a nice job, by the way. <laughs> T. Frank. I, I appreciate it, Paul. I don't think anyone can see me back here. Um, you mentioned earlier getting everybody involved. Uh, how much does Drew's role in that play as a guy who can see the full field, and, and how hard is it to defend a quarterback who has the vision to see – backside progressions and things like that. Um, and, and then secondarily, how has he used the, uh, the tablets on the sidelines to maybe enhance some of those things if he is? Well, uh, I think the first thing is it kind of goes hand in hand with the, with the question earlier about the O-line. The quarterback can't work through his progression if we're not playing well up front on the O-line. The, the ball's got to be out. And, and our, our O-line of running backs in protection uh, and Drew's ability to adjust to protection and Nick Dawkins' ability to adjust to protection based on what we think uh, they're doing defensively. Um, that plays a part in ball distrib distribution as well. That plays a part in the quarterback being able to uh, attack the entire field. Um, the reality is more times than not, though, you're still better if the ball can come out to the first or second progression as, as much as possible. Um, and that's where scheme and route running I is important. Um, and then also having the ability to attack the, b the field from an arm strength standpoint also factors into that. Um, yards after the catch is also impacted by that. If the ball is able to get to the receivers in a hurry where now they're able to catch the ball with cushion or separation, now you're able to get more yak yards as well. Um, I think we'll see a little bit more of that on the deep ball, too. I think we'll continue to get better on the deep ball. Um, I do not want to overthrow deep balls because I think if the ball is thrown perfectly in stride or either underthrown, you still have a chance to make a play on the ball or get the interference call. Um, but I, I think we'll continue to get uh, in more rhythm and, and be even more uh, in sync in the deep ball throwing. And then to your point about the tablets, I think the tablets have been good, again, in terms of being able to make some coaching points and adjustments. Sometimes you say stuff to the guys during the game um, and make a correction, and they may have saw it differently than you. And a lot of times you'd have to wait until Sunday um, more times than not, you make a coaching point, they agree with you. Sometimes you make a coaching point and they, they felt like they saw it differently than the way you saw it, um, and they push back on that. And typically you'd have to wait till Sunday to, to resolve that. You don't have to wait anymore. You know, you, you, can, you can look at the film and those one or two times where you didn't both see it the same way, it gets it resolved real quickly. Sometimes the quarterback saw it uh, better than we saw it, and we were wrong. And sometimes, you know, we're able to make a, a coaching point, and uh, and the quarterback didn't see it that way. And and the film shows that the coaches were right. So um, that's where I think it's probably most valuable, um, and and important. James, we saw Abdul and, and Denai each get their first sacks of the year this weekend. Um, we talked to Denai post game, and he said that once you get one, they start to flow in. Um, so, what do you think that performance kind of does for their confidence moving forward? Yeah, I, I think you know. Again, I think you guys have heard me talk about the sacks 
um, already in terms of this, the type of teams you play impacts that. Uh, what the game plan is for those type of opponents impacts that. Uh, not starting fast and playing well early in the game and forcing people outside of their game plan impacts that. Um, you know, although it was probably a, a point of discussion, I don't feel like it was a concern of the coaches in terms of not feeling like we had the guys, the techniques, the fundamentals to to create sacks, pressures, and, and hits on the quarterback. So um, obviously it's it's good when it starts happening, um, and, and we would love more of it, but there's a lot more that goes into it than just beating your man. I mean, Zane Durant, I think, has been as impactful on the quarterback as anybody, and if you're just strictly looking at a stat sheet, it wouldn't tell you that. You know, but like I try to talk to our guys all the time, um, you know, and again, this is this is the people in this room as well. But but real football people, you know, they know that the, the NFL scouts know that uh, our coaching staff know it. Our players know that, um, you know, our media that covers us closely knows knows that I'm not saying the stats don't matter because the stats tell a story, but. Uh, again, I think Zane Durant's a really good example, right? I think all you guys that have watched our game closely, and I bet almost all of you guys, not only did you watch the game, but then you've also watched it in, in replays um, over and over again, um, it, it, it tells a different story. I think, I think just like we're talking about the wide receivers earlier and, and them saying, okay, if we stop this wide out, and it's hard to say that based on on our guys and, and the amount of guys that are being productive now on offense. I, I think Zane Durant's a guy that they're sitting there talking about right now that, hey, we better have a plan plan for this defensive tackle. And again, the film tells you that, not the stat sheets. Thanks, Coach. We done, Paul? Man, a few words. <laughs>